Well, welcome. Thank you guys for coming to the Three Keys to Teaching Science session. I want to ask you, how many of you believe that science is an important subject for you to teach in your homeschool? <laughs> Great. It looks like we all agree on this. So let's see. How many of you feel that you struggle with knowing what and how to teach science? And again, I see we almost all agree. I have good news for you. Today, we're going to break down those perceived complexities of teaching science into three essential keys. My name is Paige Hudson, and I've authored more than 20 books to help moms like you teach science in their homes. But more than that, I've been in the trenches of home education with you for more than 12 years. So I didn't always love science. I know that might come as a shock to you, but the story of how I acquired my love for science comes from a little thing called a gummy bear. <laughs> So I was heading into high school chemistry with much fear and trepidation. We had been warned by all the upperclassmen that this was the hardest class we would take. And to be honest with you, the first day I arrived more than a little afraid of what was going to happen. There were two entrances to the classroom, the front and the back, and our teacher walked into the back of the classroom. Within a few moments of hearing her arrive into the room, she turned the lights out. And you can imagine my fear level went from just a little bit to through the roof. What in the world was going to happen now? All of a sudden we heard a whoosh of a Bunsen burner lighting in the back. Our heads all swiveled and we saw a purple glow coming from the back of the room. And the next thing we knew, whoom, the purple light took off towards the front of the room. Our teacher walked over, flipped the lights on, and said, that was chemistry. <laughs> well, at that point, I was hooked. She went on to lecture about the principles of the reaction that we just saw and had us take notes as we went on. That day, my chemistry teacher used those three keys to inspire me to fall in love with science. And I went on to get a degree in biochemistry. And now I write programs to teach science, all because of that little gummy bear experiment. So what are the three keys? Well, first of all, we have performing some kind of hands-on scientific test. So I like to say that experiments are the flesh of science. These can be actual experiments. They can be scientific demonstrations. You can do nature study, but anything that we do to bring science face to face with our students. I like to say that doing science without hands-on activities is like a blind man going to see a movie. It'll sound great, but the honest truth is he won't have a full picture of what the movie is. And that's like doing science without any kind of hands-on. The students will learn scientific information, but they won't really have a full picture of what science is. So our second key is gathering information. Science is a marriage of facts and applications. So we need to teach those facts through things like encyclopedias, living books, videos, textbooks. As homeschoolers, we have lots of options to present the information of science. Remember that science is both a content and a context subject. So we need to give them the information from somewhere and we need to help them see science at work. So those are our first two keys. Our third key is keeping a record. We need to have our students interact with that information because they're far more likely to remember what they've learned if they write it down. So studies have shown that if we write it down, we're more likely to remember it. So that's why we have this third key, to help our students uh, remember what they've seen and what they've heard. So what do those three keys look like? Let's say we're studying rain. Well, first we can do an experiment where we make it rain in a glass. So you fill the glass part way with warm water, then you put a little shaving cream cloud on top of it, uh, drip a little bit of food coloring rain into that, and the food coloring will actually drop through the shaving cream and down into the glass, just like it's looking like it's raining. So we have some kind of demonstration for our students to see science face to face. Then we can read about rain, uh, whether we're doing that in an encyclopedia or in a book, we'll give them information about what rain is. That's our second key. And we'll write down either a mini book in a lap book or a notebooking page on weather. And that's our third key. And that's how simple your week with science can be when you're using these three keys. 
So now that we understand what the three keys are, let's go ahead and dig a little deeper into hands-on scientific tests. Remember, these hands-on scientific tests are opportunities for our students to see science in action. So we're not just talking about currents. We're actually using food coloring in hot water to see how currents work, okay? So why do you need hands-on in the first place? I know a lot of people struggle uh, with experiments and the hands-on aspect of science. So do we even need to bother with doing hands-on? Well, first of all, hands-on science reinforces the concepts. So this gives our students practical reinforcement. It helps them to see the principles of science at work. So I can read to my students about ions and metal plating. And to be honest with you, a lot of that information is going to go over their heads. Or I can take a glass of lemon juice, put a few pennies in there, let it sit for a couple hours, take the pennies out, and then I can put a nail in there and let it sit for a couple more hours and then take the nail out and show them copper plating. So I can show them the change of the nail and how the copper ions have actually adhered to the nail and how it looks different. And when I show them this, I give them a visual reference in their minds. So when we read about the principles that are at work in the experiment we just did, they'll have a visual reference in their minds to help reinforce the concepts that we're sharing. So the second reason that we want to do some kind of hands-on scientific tests in our homeschool is because, again, it gives a chance for our students to see science face-to-face. -face. So for instance, I can teach them about biological symb symbiosis, or we can go outside in nature and find some lichens. We can talk about how a lichen is an example of a biological partnership as we're learning about the facts and principles, and they can see how this works together in nature. So it gives them a chance to see science face to face. And then third, it teaches our students that science is so much more than just boring facts and figures. If all we do is teach our students facts and calculations and figures, honestly, science will be boring. So we could calculate the change in heat and its effect and how that's going to cause a hot air balloon to rise. Or we could go to a hot air balloon show and our students can see how hot air rises to see it in action, to see how it works. And even though we do need to present them with the facts and the figures and the calculations and all these things as part of science, to give them that visual reference again, to give them that experience with science beforehand helps the facts and figures seem a lot less boring. And the fourth reason we want to do some kind of hands-on is it fosters creativity. I know we don't regularly think of art when it comes to science, but the truth is that playing with science can foster creativity. Our students can feel a little bit like a mad scientist as they're doing chromatography. Uh, they can draw, uh, you know, a they can draw a design on a coffee filter or a t-shirt and then drip some rubbing alcohol on it and watch it spread out. And they'll create a beautiful piece of art. At the same time, they'll learn a little bit about chromatography and science. So we need to do some kind of hands-on because it helps reinforce the concepts. It presents science face-to-face. -face. It shows that science is more than facts and figures, and it fosters our students' creativity. So as homeschoolers, we have lots of options. We don't have to necessarily follow a set dictated uh, method. So what types of hands-on scientific tests are at our disposal? Well, first of all, we have demonstrations, scientific demonstrations. These are parent-led. So in other words, you're going to be the one doing most of the action, doing most of the work for the demonstration while your students are observing. There's a classic demonstration called elephant toothpaste. I love to do this with my preschoolers when we talk about the letter E. Basically, you mix a little bit of hydrogen peroxide and some dish soap in one container, and in another one, you mix a little bit of water and yeast, and then you add that into the water bottle that has the hydrogen peroxide and dish soap, and the yeast acts as a catalyst, and the reaction spills bubbles up and over and out of the water bottle, and we can use that as toothpaste for our little elephants. 
So the kids love to watch something like that. And we may, you know, share a little bit about how the yeast speeds up the reaction that's already happening. And the dish soap helps us to capture those bubbles and see uh, it come up and out of there. But basically, these kids are watching something. They're watching science and seeing that science is cool. So the second type of hands-on scientific test we can do is a more formal experiment. So these, your student is going to be doing while you, as a parent, are going to mentor them through. And this is going to follow the process of the scientific method, which is just a method of asking a question and finding the answer. So a scientist will ask a question, they'll do a little research, they'll formulate a hypothesis, they'll test that hypothesis, they'll analyze their results and observations, and they'll draw a conclusion. So a classic uh, experiment you could do with your students is measuring the speed of light with a chocolate bar. Basically, you'll take the spinning plate out of the microwave, you'll put in a chocolate bar, and you'll melt it at 30 second increments until you can see two spots. And that's the wave, the microwave coming in and going out. Those are the nodes. You'll measure that and then you can use those calculations uh, to find the speed of light or very close to the speed of light. So that would be an example of an experiment. The third thing we can use as homeschoolers is a nature study. And basically nature study is finding science in nature. So you're looking for those principles of science in nature. And you can do this in an impromptu way. In other words, you, when you see something, you can study it, or you can do it as a Friday fun day, a scheduled day uh, throughout your week. And then the last thing we can use is the science fair project. This is something we should do once a year, once our kids reach uh, middle school years. And this is a chance for them to use the scientific method from start to finish. And then if you have a kid who's a little bit of a digital nut, you can use things like YouTube or Pet or Late Night Labs, uh, some kind of online lab. So what do you use when? Well, during the preschool years, we like to do things like scientific demonstrations. So you'll be showing science to your students because at this point, they don't really have a lot of a grasp of the different principles in science. So you really, you need to be presenting science to them. Uh, through either nature study or scientific demonstrations. Your goal during these years is to introduce and ignite a passion for science. So as you move into the elementary years, you're still going to be using those demonstrations, but moving towards experiments as their knowledge base of science increases, and they'll be able to formulate a hypothesis. Remember, a hypothesis is an educated guess. So in other words, they need to have a knowledge bank to draw from to be able to formulate a hypothesis. Does that mean that they can't make a guess as you're doing demonstrations? By all means, let them guess away. Uh, but if you want to actually formulate a hypothesis, they need to have some kind of research or, or knowledge bank to draw from to make that. So we like to save those formal experiments for later on in the elementary years or for middle school or high school. You can keep using nature study during the elementary years. Basically, your goal during those years is to fill their knowledge banks. So as you move on to the middle school and high school years, these guys are becoming the captains of their educational ship. So they're going to be able to do experiments where they're leading and you are mentoring them through. They're going to be able to do those science fair projects. Uh, they're going to be able to use online labs and they'll also be able to do things like nature study, which is why nature study is great to do with the whole family. So how often should you do this? About once a week. I like to recommend you do some kind of hands-on science activity at least once a week uh, through your school year. So how do you succeed with experiments or how do you succeed with the hands-on aspect of science? Well, my number one tip is to have the materials on hand. So whether you gather those materials at regular intervals and have a science supply cabinet that you keep them in, or whether you purchase an experiment kit or even make your own. Having those materials on hand will make it so much easier to actually do the experiments each week. Uh, because if you do have the stuff on hand, you won't be tempted to skip that experiment because you don't have what you need. So the second tip I have is to plan ahead. So knowing what kind of hands-on activities you're going to do each week. And then if you are going to do some kind of demonstration, uh, make sure you read through the directions, the results, the explanation, because if you understand where the um, 
demonstration or experiment is supposed to be going, it's much easier to guide your students through. The third tip I have is to follow the directions. I give this tip for myself as well because directions do not equal a recipe. If you're like me, when you get into the kitchen, a little more of this, a little more of that, you know, it doesn't really matter. You can change that recipe up. Well, in the lab, a little more of this, a little more of that could end up with the fire department showing up. So your directions are time tested and you need to actually follow what they say. My fourth and final tip for succeeding with the hands-on aspect of science is to discuss why and how. So talk with your students, discuss the explanation that you have for the experiment or demonstration. And if it didn't quite work uh, the way you wanted it to, discuss why it did or why it didn't work. Uh, did you skip something in the directions? Uh, were your materials outdated? I know one time we tried to uh, blow up a balloon with the yeast fermentation reaction and my yeast was so old it was dead. So it didn't work. And these are opportunities for us to discuss why it didn't work. And then you also want to discuss because you want to relate uh, the experiment to what you're going to study and help your students make those connections. In the beginning, you'll be spoon feeding that connection to your student, uh, but as they get older, you'll kind of guide or lead them through the process of making those connections. So that's a quick look at the first key of performing hands-on scientific tests. If you remember, our three keys are those performing hands-on scientific tests, gathering information, and keeping a record. Let's take a closer look at gathering information. Remember, this is our chance to learn about the principles because science is both a content and a context subject. So we need to share those principles of science with our students. Let's look at why we need to have our students gather information or why this is a second key for teaching science at home. So the first reason is that science is a marriage of facts and applications. So it's not only information and principles and things that we know to be true, we also need to see those principles in action or to test new ideas um, of science. So science is this marriage between facts and applications. Our students need to know what's proven true in science, but they also need to see it. They need to have a visual reference of that as well. So the second reason why we want to gather information with our students is to build their knowledge base. Our students can't know everything there is to know about science within the first 30 minutes. There's so much to know. So we need to build this knowledge base over time. So we're starting early and often uh, with you know, teaching science or doing science in preschool or elementary years and teaching them the very basic parts. And then we're teaching, we're building upon that knowledge base uh, through the elementary years and through the middle school years and the high school years. And they'll graduate having a pretty good grasp of science. Uh, but we'll be building that knowledge base over time and then we'll be feeding them with age appropriate facts. So we're not going to teach our elementary student how to balance equations. Um, like we talked about the elephant toothpaste earlier, I could show my high schooler what the reaction for that was, and we can discuss more in depth about how uh, the yeast acts as a catalyst, as a catalyst, and why that is, and all that kind of information. But my elementary student doesn't need to know that. My elementary student just needs to know that if I add something called a catalyst, it speeds up the reaction. So we're feeding them with age-appropriate facts. Or, you know, we may just even need to teach our elementary student that, hey, this is a reaction. You know, when I mix these two things together, something happens and it changes. So we're feeding them with just the basics. And then we're building upon that during the middle school and our high school years. We want to gather information with our students because science is facts and applications and because we need to build their knowledge base over time. So what do we use to do this? Uh, like I've said before with the experiments, as homeschoolers, we have so many options. We don't have to stick to the standard textbook, although you can do that if you want. So the first thing we can use is living books. And typically we would think of living books for uh, history. So living books are books that are written by an authority on the subject and they weave facts into the storyline. Um, so basically a living book will draw the student in to the point where they'll be uh, interested in the story 
so much that they'll learn the facts without even realizing it. So it engages the reader and helps them want to continue to read more because they want to continue to read the story and then they're learning along at the same time. So that's why living books can be very effective tools for homeschoolers. So some of the older options that we have for living books, I'll give one caveat about using older options. Uh, there's been a few scientific advancements in the last hundred years. So you need to be careful when you choose an older option that there may be some things or some pieces of information in there that aren't quite as accurate. Uh, because we've learned quite a bit more about things like chemistry and physics over the last hundred years. But these are some of my favorite older options for living books. Uh, the books by Thornton Burgess, the bird books by him. Uh, you've got the parables of nature, Mother West Wind. Uh, there's a series called Among the it's Farmyard People, Forest People, that series. Uh, the Storybook of Science, The Wonder Book of Chemistry, Again, you got to be careful. There's been a few advancements in chemistry, uh, but it's still a good book. And Madam How and Lady Why. So those are interesting books that have been written in the past about science that are in more story format. And then more modern options. Um, you can use The Cat in the Hat is a great series for preschoolers as it rhymes along, as it shares the scientific facts. Um, you got the Let's Read and Find Out series. Not technically a living book, but way more interesting than a nonfiction book. And then we have written the Sassafras Science Series. Uh, there's also a living history library, which has uh, books on, or biographies for uh, scientists like Galen or Copernicus. And then there's a book called The Disappearing Spoon, which is wonderful for high schoolers about the history of chemistry. So those are some options that you could use for living books. Uh, the second type of resource that we could use is encyclopedias. I'm not talking about the full set of 26 encyclopedias that took up a whole bookshelf on your parents, uh, in your parents' living room. Anybody here have one of those? <laughs> yeah, we did too. So what I'm talking about here is the highly visual uh, children's encyclopedias, those put out by uh, DK, by Usborne, by Kingfisher, and even the little cartoony basher books. All of those are packed with information uh, in a visually appealing way. So you'll be able, your students will be able to get uh, snippets of information as they read from these encyclopedias. So some younger options for encyclopedias. Uh, the first encyclopedias from uh, DK, Usborne, and Kingfisher, they pretty much all have these, you know, first nature encyclopedia, first human body encyclopedia, or those are good options for your younger students. Uh, Kingfisher also puts out the series called uh, Discover Science. Or actually, I think they've changed it. I think it's Kingfisher Young Knowledge series now. And then they also put out these Basher Science books. I will say that they are cartoony and they can be a little irreverent, the Basher Science books. So please, please, please preview those to see if it's appropriate for your children. And then some all-in-one options that I highly recommend uh, you get on your shelf at some point, usually in the later elementary uh, middle school years. These are great references to have on your shelf, whether you use them for science or not. I like the Usborne Science Encyclopedia. That's really great for about third through fifth grade. Uh, the Kingfisher Science Encyclopedia is good for about fifth through seventh grade. And then the DK Encyclopedia of Science, and that's a great reference from seventh grade on. So those are good all-in-one options for you to have on your shelf. Another resource we can use as homeschoolers is textbooks. I know you're thinking, why in the world is she mentioning textbooks? We're homeschoolers. We don't touch those. But textbooks have their value too. So especially during the high school years, textbooks are great options because they'll cover everything in a pretty comprehensive format. They'll go through in the order you need to go through. Um, and it just makes it easier to use a textbook, especially in high school. So I like Prentice Hall, uh, Miller and Levine, CK12. Those are good publishers for standard high school textbooks. Uh, there are plenty of other publishers for textbooks out there. Obviously, preview them before you use them with your kids. If you want to use uh, textbooks with younger options or with younger students, there are options out there. Um, in fact, we have a friend of a friend who used to sleep with her textbook under her pillow at night. So if you have a younger student who loves textbooks that much, by all means, go ahead, use textbooks. They definitely have their value. 
And then the fourth option we have as homeschoolers is YouTube. There are lots of really well done videos uh, by people like ACS Reactions or TED Ed that you can use uh, as a reference or a resource uh, to gather information. You can you could use it as your sole source of information. It would just take a lot of searching to find that. Um, but you can use it as a backup or a reference for uh, what you're studying. But always, always, always pre-screen because some people like to put things into a video that shouldn't be there for little eyes. So when you're using YouTube, always do that. So for gathering information, we can use things like living books, encyclopedias, textbooks, YouTube videos. I'm sure there's other articles and things like that that we can use. But what do we use when? So during the early years, in the beginning, we read to them. Obviously, they're still learning the skills of how to read uh, the basics of their numbers and phonics and all these things. So during their early years, we don't want our kids to struggle with science because it's difficult to read. So we'll read to them. So as they get older, we'll have them read more and more. And my only caveat here is to say that when you're choosing to assign reading for science, it's perfectly fine to keep it below their reading level. So your student may be reading on a fifth grade reading level, um, but it's perfectly fine to give them a science book that's at a third grade reading level because then they can focus on the information they're trying to learn rather on the physical act of reading. So they're not struggling through reading, they're learning the information. So as they get older, you can have them read in more and more, but keep that below the reading level so they're not struggling with the actual act of reading. And how often should we gather information? Like we said earlier, uh, we should gather or we should do hands-on science once a week. We need to gather information about twice a week. So we'll be doing some kind of related hands-on once a week, and then we'll be gathering information about the principles that were going on in that uh, demonstration or experiment about twice a week. And how can you succeed with gathering information? Well, my first tip is to keep it interesting. So you want to use books that hold in their interest. You want them to be excited about reading science. You don't want them to groan every time you pull out whatever resource you're using. So if you love the idea of a living book, but your student just wants the facts and prefers a textbook or an encyclopedia, then you need to use what keeps what will hold their interest. But you may find that your student just prefers textbooks or they prefer living books or they prefer to watch YouTube videos. And as much as possible, we want to cater to uh, that preference. Of course, you know, ultimately, sometimes there are things that they just need to learn uh, and it needs to happen from a certain resource and that's fine. But as much as possible, we want to help to keep it interesting and give them resources that they will enjoy learning from. So the second tip is to always discuss. Like we talked about with the experiments, we always wanna discuss what we're doing. For our younger students, we'll be reading to them. So we'll read the selection to them and then we'll ask them more broad and leading questions. So what did you find interesting about what we just read? What is one thing you remember? Or we can ask them more uh, leading questions like, what does the fur on a polar bear's feet do? So we're looking for a specific piece of information when we ask those more leading questions. But you always want to discuss that with your younger students before you ask them to write down a thing. And then your older students, you can ask a more specific and thought-provoking questions. So you want to ask them something like, so they've read the selection. You may or may not read it with them. If you're coming up with your own questions, you're probably going to need to read them. If you have a good curriculum that has those uh, answers to the questions for you, you don't have to worry about reading it. Um, but they're going to be reading on their own. And then you're going to ask some questions like, uh, you're going to ask some more specific questions. So you're going to say, how is the polar bear suited for life in the Arctic? So we're making them think about the information that they've just read. And the reason why we're doing these two things, why we're keeping it interesting and why we're discussing things with or why we're discussing orally with them after we finished reading is because that discussion time prepares the students for the third key. So we've chatted about performing hands-on scientific tests and we've discussed gathering information. Now we're going to look at the third and final key, which is keeping a record. 
And remember from back when we first discussed the three keys, we're keeping a record because it increases their retention. It helps them to remember what we're studying. So that's the main purpose of this third key is to give our students uh, to increase their memory of what we're learning. So let's look a little bit closer at three reasons why we need to uh, keep a record for science. The first one is because it gives our students a chance to interact with the material one more time. So it gives them another touch point. So we're looking at each week, we're reading, we're writing down, we're doing some kind of hands-on activity, we're reading, we're writing down. So we're giving them five different touch points during the week uh, to interact with this material. And the more times they interact it, the more times they see it, the more times they uh, write with it or do it, the more likely they'll be to remember it. So we need to give our students multiple times to interact with this material. The second reason we're going to keep a record is because it increases retention. There was a study done in the 70s and another one done back in the 90s uh, that showed that writing it down actually increases a person's retention of the material. In fact, they were able to quantify that and say that if someone writes down what they've heard, they're 34% more likely to remember it. So by asking our students to write it down, we're laying that foundation for future studies. We're building their knowledge base, uh, giving them a greater chance at success in remembering uh, what they've learned. So Pepperdine University likes to tell their students how to study for a class. And this is what they say. They say, you need to get the information. And that's what we're doing in the second key. You need to use it, and that's what we're having our student do by writing a narration or a summary or in this third key. They need to link it, which is discussion. So that's our discussion time with you, and then they need to picture it, and that's our chance why we'll use uh, images, sketches, our experiments, so all those things. So there, our students need to get the information, they need to link it, they need to use it, and they need to picture it. Okay, and the third reason why we need to keep a record is because it provides material for review. So rather than having to make up review sheets or you remember those big review worksheets you'd have to do in school, instead we're going to pull out our notebook or our lap book or whatever our students have written in and we can use it to review the unit. And this can happen naturally when our kids pull it off the shelf. In fact, um, the other day, our daughter found one of her lap books from science from first grade, and she pulled it down, and we kind of talked about what she learned. And granted, she's in high school now, so it wasn't, you know, this these are things she already knows. But it was good review for her brother, who did biology the previous year. So having material that your students have written down are chances for review later on. So how do we do this? How do we keep a record with our students? Well, the first thing we need to do for science, we need to record our hands-on. So they're writing down what they learned from those demonstrations, from the experiments, from the nature study, keeping some kind of record. Uh, of course, in the beginning, it's going to be super simple. So we have these super simple pictorial records. It'll be one or two dictated sentences. I'm going to step on my writing soapbox right now and tell you guys a little story about how I almost killed our daughter's love of science. Sometimes as homeschooling parents, we get a little overzealous. We want to have our subjects all coordinate and have each one, uh, you know, teach what they're doing and blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm talking about. So I had it in my head that I was going to use science and history to teach writing. So I was expecting our daughter to write beyond her abilities or to push right at her ability uh, for science. And she ended up hating science and history. And it wasn't because she hated the content or the things we were studying. It was because she hated to write. And so at that point, when I realized that she was starting to dislike subjects purely because I was requiring, requiring her to write at or beyond her ability, uh, that's when I decided to scale back. So I tell you that story because I don't want you to end up in the same place and make the same mistake I did. Keep that writing simple. It's okay if your student is in first and second grade and you're still writing for them. They're still dictating to you in science or in history if you want. Um, because they're still working on the physical act of writing. It's tough. It's tough to learn to write. It's tough to learn to read, to do those kinds of things. So you want to keep... Uh, 
your you want to keep the writing and the reading you require in science a little below their level so that it's easy for them and they enjoy it and they don't end up hating the subject because they're struggling with the act of writing. And now I'm stepping back off my writing and science soapbox and we'll look at how elementary students can keep a record of their hands-on science. So I like to use lab sheets for those, a very simple lab sheet, but we're starting to get them to think more of what a record of an experiment is gonna look like. So we're gonna have four sections in this. We're gonna have our tools, our method, our outcome, and our insight. So these are all gonna be in their words. So the method is going to be, you know, very simplistic. We did this, we did that. It's not, um, it does, they don't even have to call all, they don't even have to cover all of the steps. We just want them to have a small record of what they did so they can look back and jog their memory later on. And their insights in the beginning may be as simple as I liked this or it was cool. And that's perfectly fine in the beginning for their insights to be very simple. Um, but of course, as they get older, we want those insights to have a little bit of scientific information in them. So as they get older, we'll be moving into the experiment report. And this will be around the middle school years when they start being able to write quite a bit more. These experiment reports are going to have a title. They're going to have some sort of uh, hypothesis. They'll have the materials. They'll have a procedure. And the goal with this procedure, by the time they graduate, so you got plenty of time to get this, by the time they graduate, you want the procedure to be a detailed record of what you did in the experiment so that somebody could come in, read their procedure, and do the experiment that they just did by only reading the procedure. Of course, this needs to be in their own words. So we're moving towards, in, through the middle school and high school years, we're working towards having them be able to write a procedure that somebody could come in and do the experiment from. And then we'll have observations and results. The difference between those are observations are things that are seen, results are specific and measured. And then we'll have a conclusion. And of course, at this point, that conclusion should have quite a bit about the scientific principles um, that we learned. But again, this is a process they'll be learning from middle school all the way through high school. There'll be plenty of time to work on that. And as they get into high school, we might want to add once or twice. If they're planning on going into science, you might want to have them write a full experiment report in which they'll have an abstract and a work cited. So they'll do a little bit of research around their experiment uh, write an abstract that's just, you know, a paragraph or two of, of what they did or what they, of the science behind uh, the experiment, and then a works cited page. So that's what a full-blown experiment report will look like in college. So the end goal, again, the end goal is to get to that point. So you've got plenty of time to prepare them for that. And then the other type of hands-on science we talked about in the first key is those nature studies. And if we're doing more formal nature study, then we want them to keep a nature journal. And in that nature journal, I like to have my students write at least the date and the location uh, so that when we look back at it, we can say, hey, you know, in January, we saw blah, blah, blah at blah, blah, blah. Let's go see if we can find that again. So I like them to put the date and the location and then one sentence of what they learned. And then we'll add a picture or a sketch. Of course, the older your students are, they can add more than one sentence. But I like to keep our nature journals simple. It's just a record of what your student has learned. And you want these to be a very personal record because it's a journal. Let's chat a little bit about recording the information that your student have, has learned. So we always want to discuss before the writing. And the reason we want to discuss is because it helps our students formulate what they want to write down. So we're doing some kind of narration. They're orally telling us what they want. And then notebooking, they're writing it down. So we'll always discuss and then we'll write. So at the very beginning, we can use a simple thing like a coloring page. So we'll have a discussion time with our students. We'll ask them what they learned, and then we'll go back. We'll emphasize a point that's on that coloring page and color a related picture uh, with that point. As they get a little older, we can have them do copy work of that point. So they'll have a record of what they've learned, but they won't have to have struggled through a lot of writing. Uh, the next thing we can use is lap books. 
Lap books are really great with younger students because there's less white space to throw them off. In these, we'll have a related mini book with a short summary. You, they can dictate the sentence to you, or you can have them start to write it down on their own. And these little mini books will be pasted into a file folder or on a sheet of paper. Some people put them in notebooks. However you want to keep your lap book is fine. If you have a student who's a bit more creative, they may find that lap books are better than notebooks as well. As they get a little bit older, we like to move into notebooking. And I love notebooking because this is really a record of what the student finds meaningful. So I prefer notebooking over comprehension worksheets, but of course you could use comprehension work, worksheets as well. But basically in that notebooking sheet, you're gonna have a visual reference or a picture of what the student has studied along with uh, one to five sentences of what they learned. And then finally, as they get older, we're gonna move from notebooking and we're going to move towards uh, having them write lists of facts from what they've read, and then they'll write an outline from what they've read, and then they'll write a summary from what they've read. They'll move from this progression of notebooking to more structured list of facts, to even more structured outlines, to full-blown summaries. And then, of course, we'll still add sketches uh, in the middle school and high school years, because again, we want to connect that visual, the, the one half of the brain to the other half of the brain. So we'll have that visual and the material component. And how often should you be doing this? Uh, you should be keeping a record about twice a week. Um, you may do it three times a week as your student can write better, but basically every time you read and discuss, you want to do a written assignment. And then when you do a demonstration, you want to do a written assignment too. So a few tips to help you with writing. Uh, the first tip, make it easy. Again, you don't want to uh, overtax your students. You don't want to push them beyond their abilities and make them hate science uh, because the writing is too hard. So you want to make your keeping a record easy. You want to keep it fun. You want to make it fun. Switch it up. So maybe one week you'll do lap books. Maybe another unit you'll do notebooking. Um, maybe you'll do some kind of video record of what they've done. But you want to keep them interested in the writing. Make it fun. And then you want to make it visual. So you always want to add photos, drawings, pictures, sketches, uh, because this helps to connect both parts of the brain. So they're getting some kind of uh, visual reference and they're also getting some kind of written reference. So if you make it easy, fun, and visual, you'll be able to keep a record of what you've learned in science with your students. Well, the last thing I want to do is encourage you that teaching science at home doesn't have to be difficult, as long as you include the three keys. So you have hands-on scientific tests, you have gathering information, and you have record keeping. Thank you all for coming, and if you still have questions or want to see what this looks like in a science curriculum, you can find me at the Elemental Science booth.